Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to the uh, webinar on acute kidney injury. Um, if you just give us a few more minutes, we'll just wait for a few more people to join and we'll get started. Great, thank you. So hi everyone, my name's Lizzie. I'm uh, currently uh, an anaesthetics ST1 doing my uh, A&E placement. Um, I'm currently doing this from my phone due to some technical issues, so do bear with me. Samsung's gonna kindly do the um, PowerPoint for me. So today we're doing acute kidney injury, um, which is something you're definitely gonna be coming across throughout your um, foundation years and throughout your career. Samsung, can go to the next slide, please. So today we're gonna cover what AKI is, an acute kidney injury, um, what the risk factors are for developing acute kidney injury and what to look out for. Then we'll go through the causes of AKI and then how to approach a patient. So how to take a history, the examination findings you might get, and then lastly, how to manage patients with acute kidney injury. Next slide. So just a pointer, so AKI has now replaced the acute renal failure terminology, and it's essentially a reduction in renal function, uh, which can happen over days to weeks, uh, sometimes even hours. Um, essentially, the excretion of the kidney is malfunctioning, which means that your fluid balance, your acid base balance, um, the homeostasis going on in the body is all impaired. Uh, I think currently it's about 15% of all hospital admissions are secondary or are linked to acute kidney injury, so it's certainly popular uh, amongst patients. And in terms of the uh, in incidence, it's increasing due to increased uh, comorbidities amongst an ageing population. Um, and also we're looking out for it a lot more. There's lots more drive to pick them up early. So you'll certainly come across it quite frequently. In terms of the actual definition, so um, it's three separate criteria. So either it's a rise in serum creatinine of 26 micromole per litre uh, or more within a 48 hour period, or it's that the baseline serum creatinine has increased by 50% within the last seven days, or it's a fall in urine output uh, over a six hour period of less than 0.5 millilitres per kilogram per hour. Just a note to say is that we are looking at serum creatinine in um, an AKI. EGFR is to the estimated uh, filtration rate is useful in your CKDs, but within your um, acute kidney injuries, because the creatinine is so up and down and it's a dynamic process, sometimes the um, EGFR can overestimate or underestimate the kidney function. So within the um, remits of AKI, we're referring to creatinine. So if we just go on to the next slide. So this is busy. So some of these slides are quite um, busy slides, I apologise, but there's quite a lot of information to get across. Now, by no means panic looking at this slide. I appreciate there's a lot of information. It's just a point to say that that is the baseline criteria for an acute kidney injury, but it can be classified into, two, into three further stages. So stage one is what we've mentioned, the increase of 26 um, micromole per litre or more within 48 hours. The baseline is increasing by 50%. So we say kind of one and a half to two times the baseline within seven days, or the, there's oliguria over six hours. Stage two is more that the, the baseline over seven days has gone up by two to three times the baseline. Um, and again, the oliguria can be present for 12 hours. And stage three is that the uh, baseline creatinine has gone up by three times plus within seven days. The urine output, so essentially you're mostly anuric, so the urine output is less than 0.3 mil per kilogram per hour over 24 hours or complete anuria for 12 hours. And by anuria, we mean no urine output. Or there's a caveat that it's the same as stage one, that it goes up by more than 26 or goes up uh, by one to two times 
uh, within 48 hours, but that the, the creatinine is more than 354. It's a specific number, but it's still relative to their baseline. So if their baseline is 370 and the creatinine has only gone up to 372, it's not an acute kidney injury. If it's gone from 370 to 410, so it's gone up by more 20 than 26 micromole per litre in 24 hours, uh, sorry, micromole per litre within 48 hours, then it would be an AKI and it would be stage three because of the level of the creatinine. So again, don't panic too much about it. You don't certainly don't need to memorize this off by heart. The point is to have an appreciation for what's my baseline diagnosis for an acute kidney injury and have an appreciation for what the different stages are because the higher the stage, the higher the morbidity and mortality. With online systems and everything, these things do get flagged. So you just, again, don't need to um, remember it, kind of the criteria uh, to memory, but it's good to have an appreciation. So with that in mind, and again, don't panic because I don't expect you to memorize this. I just want you to have a go. If you go to the next slide. So you've got a 65 year old lady who's been admitted with diarrhea and vomiting. Her blood tests are below. Bearing in mind what we've said already, if you can remember, how would you classify her AKI? So uh, you've got the bloods from five days ago on the left-hand side, and you've got the bloods from today. Have a quick look through. We'll give you a couple of minutes and see if you can have a go at that question. You can write it in the comments down below. I hope you can see everything. So if you, just in case you can't see, on the left-hand side, the Krasnin is 85, and that was five days ago. And the bloods from admission today is a Krasnin of 210. I'll just give you a couple more minutes to have a think. Again, don't worry if you haven't memorized that busy slide. I haven't memorized the busy slide, so don't worry. Okay, so if we go on to the next slide. So this is a stage two AKI. So the creatinine has gone up by about uh, two and a half from the baseline within a seven day period. Obviously we don't have the urine output documented and you may not. Um, and remember, it's not, uh, it can be one or the other. It doesn't have to be both parts of the criteria um, reached. So this lady says a stage two AKI because a baseline creatinine has increased between two, by two and a half ish uh, within a seven day period. Okay, so on to the next slide. So in terms of risk factors, so as with anything in medicine, prevention is better than cure, right? So when you're seeing patients, before you've even got the blood back, or if, if they have a normal renal function, you still need to think about, is this patient at risk of developing an AKI? And the reason for that is, again, because of the mortality and the morbidity associated with it. So in terms of the um, presenting complaint, if patients are presenting with diarrhea, vomiting, a change in their GCS, meaning that oral intake is compared, or reduced urine output, that's someone who might be at risk of developing um, an AKI. Equally, uh, the acute illnesses, so patients are over 65, they have a background of CKD or may have had previous AKI and proof submissions. If they have presented with sepsis, if they're on a multitude of nephrotoxic meds or have had recent contrast, or again, cognitive impairment, they may be at higher risk. So this is nice guidelines um, uh, advice in terms of what the risk factors would be. So again, it doesn't mean these people are going to develop an AKI. But it's something to appreciate that if you're clerking them in and you're reviewing them, is this person in front of me high risk for developing um, a renal impairment? Next slide. So if we go on to the causes of AKI, next slide. So the um, way to, uh, best way to clarify it or classify it, if you're presenting or if you're approaching a patient, is to think about if it's a pre-renal cause, a renal cause, or a post-renal cause. So if we go through these individually, so your pre-renal cause is uh, the most common cause of AKI that you'll come across. Um, and it's usually something we can reverse quite quickly um, if, if recognized. So different causes of that may be fluid losses. So if you have someone who's dehydrated, reduced oral intake, having lots of uh, diarrhea, vomiting, they might have RAS tubes or NG tubes um, that have got high output losses or stoma bags, et cetera. Patients who are third spacing, so perhaps if they have cardiac failure, heart failure, a background of CKD, they may be intravascularly dry, but fluid is going into the wrong space. Um, another thing, major hemorrhage, uh, bleeding, upper GI bleeds, maybe another occult cause under nine, everything that may put them at high risk of uh, hypovolemia and therefore pre-renal cause. Um, some medications, so if you think about your, um, your diuretics, particularly if they're on, they've had stonking doses of frizomide given, 
um, if they're on big blood pressure tablets in multiple doses, high doses, uh, alongside any of these things, sepsis, major hemorrhage, etc., they're going to be at high risk of intravascular depletion. And remember that your kidneys are getting about 25% of your cardiac output. So if you're getting a reduction in blood flow, uh, the kidneys are going to start trying to hold onto fluid, concentrate the urine, um, reabsorb sodium, and try and uh, replete the intravascular space. So any of these losses, a drop in the blood pressure is going to mean that there's less cardiac output going to the, the kidney overall. And then something to bear in the back of your mind is renal artery stenosis, not really something you're going to pick up immediately, but is a pre-renal cause uh, for patients. So in primary care, a patient who's got background hypertension has been started on an ACE inhibitor and has a disproportional rise in their uh, creatinine. Um, it may be worth thinking about that as a cause. Next slide. So then we get onto the renal side, so the, the renal causes. So this is if there's structural damage to the kidney itself. Um, so you can break this down by the structures within the kidney. So um, toxins and drugs are a big thing. So nephrotoxics um, can cause lots of different things. So if you go via, sometimes it's easier to go via the structures. So vascular causes, we're thinking about your vasculitic screens or again, um, gross vascular changes. So uh, diabetes, hypertension, causing gross vascular changes, atherosclerotic disease, uh, can have effects on the kidney as well as elsewhere in the body. Your vasculitis, so things like lupus, uh, vagueness, um, your small vessel vasculitis um, can all contribute and affect the kidney as well. In terms of your glomerula, which is a word I can't say, I apologise, if you have, and again I can't say this, glomerular nephritis, uh, so inflammation of your uh, glomeruli, um, so things like I think your nephrotic and your nephritic syndromes, if you go down that pathway, they can lead to a renal, uh, intrinsic renal failure, causing an AKI. The most uh, important ones, those are your rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, um, which are important ones to pick up. Um, and then from a tubular and interstitial point of view, again, that can be from hypotension or hypoperfusion to the kidney, causing um, most commonly it's ATN, so your acute tubular necrosis. Um, and that's normally from prolonged renal hypoperfusion. Also some medications, so going back to toxins and drugs, so um, NSAIDs, uh, omeprazole, lanzoprazole, penicillins can cause interstitial inflammation. And longer term, it means that you can get scarring and fibrosis, so the function of the kidney is impaired. So again, as a, an F1 or a PA or um, someone a junior who's reviewing a patient, you don't necessarily need to think, gosh, I need to start doing biopsies, et cetera, and renal screens. But it's important to have that in the back of your mind of could this be a vas uh, um, an intrinsic cord that's driving my AKI? And the next slide, please. And then the last one is your post-renal, um, which apparently is the least common. I think a nice said it's about 10% of um, AKI is a secondary to post renal, but I've certainly come across it quite quite a lot, at least as a contributing factor. So this is there is down basically downstream obstruction from the kidneys, so within your ureters, the bladder, prostate, urethra, which is causing backflow and increasing your pressures within the kidney. Um, so common causes again, your renal stones, which can cause blockage and get hydronephrosis, um, benign prostatic hyperplasia. If they have long term catheters that are blocked, um, malignancies downstream in your ureters, your prostate, your bladder. Um, or if they've got a neurogenic bladder from, uh, I don't know, like multiple sclerosis, or they've got atonic bladders, uh, which might mean that the bladder isn't um, functioning as it should be. So these are all post renal causes to consider when reviewing your patient. Next slide. So uh, see if I can read this. This is in a scenario to get you thinking about what the causes in this patient could be for their AKI. So you are the F1 on call, and you've been called to see a 79 year old gentleman who's had been in for a couple of days and they've had a bit of confusion, reduced oil intake. Overnight, there was a one-off temperature of 37.8, but otherwise his obs are fine. Um, the catheter that he's got in situ was from admission. Um, the nurses say, oh, it's been draining, but we haven't had time to document the output. We didn't realise we we were you know, that was required. In, in terms of personal medical history, so this long-term catheter has been in situ uh, for a long time now. Uh, he's got benign prostatic hyperplasia and a background of CKD. Uh, that's all the information you have. So again, we've got his blood stream emission on the left-hand side, which is from two days ago, and then he's got his bloods today. So having a look, can you cast your mind back to the first few slides, the busy one, and have a think about what his stage his AKI might be? And then having a look at his what he's presented with, what the kind of what's been going on in this admission, what his past medical history is. Just have a little think, try and jot down as many uh, causes, whether it's pre-renal 
renal, post-renal that you can think of um, that might be contributing to this gentleman's AKI. So again, a couple of minutes, I'm just going to have some water. I apologise if it's noisy, by the way. I'm sitting in um, uh, one of the offices at work, so people are coming in and out. Um, so apologies, I can't um, stop them, unfortunately. So again, a 79-year-old, two days admission, confusion, reduced oral intake, a one-off low-grade temperature, and a background of a long-term catheter, BPH and CKD. So what stage AKI do you think this gentleman has? And what do you think the possible causes of his AKI could be before you've even gone to see him? So just in case you can't see, on admission, um, so his haemoglobin was 115, white cells 10 and CRP6. His potassium and sodium were with, within normal limits and he has the urea of eight and a creatinine of 125. Today, uh, his haemoglobin is stable. His white cells have gone from 10 to 16. His CRP has gone from six to 45. His urea eight to 12 and his creatinine 125 to 155. So have a think what the causes might be. So we've got a few people replying, mm -hmm. Lizzie. Uh, quite a few people saying uh, stage one, uh, <laughs> a lot of people saying post renal from BPH and uh, long term catheter. Yeah, got lovely. a lot of people saying pre renal hypovolemia due to reduced oral intake as well. Yeah, great. Perfect. Should we go on to the next slide and see what I thought? I think I generally agree from my own scenario. So, yeah, I agree that this was a stage one AKI. Uh, his creatinine's increased by about 30 in a, 20, in a 48 hour period. So, I agreed on that one. So I thought pre-renal, I agree, some reduced oral intake, maybe a bit of infection, his inflammatory markers have gone up, there's a long-term catheter in situ, and there's a low-grade temperature. Um, so again, maybe, you know, that's driving the reduced oral intake. We assume he's not septic from his observations, but we need to do a bit more digging into that. Uh, I thought arguably intrinsic, we don't know what this background of the CKD is, what's driving the CKD. Could it be a progression of that that's driving the AKI? Um, again, unlikely given the 48 hour period, but we don't, without knowing the etiology, uh, difficult to know. And then I agree, so post-renally we've got the background of BPH, there is a catheter in situ, so could the catheter be blocked, do we need to flush it? We don't, we have been told it's draining, but we need to make sure we know that for ourselves and we see some output. So within one patient, we've demonstrated there can be multiple causes for AKI. And as with anything, if you're going to see a patient, I always think it's good to think what is the presenting plane or what's the main issue and how can I, what my red flags or what my main things I'm looking for when I see, when I go to review them, because that's what I, what I want to rule out as I'm going through my history and my examination. Um, remember your history and examination is a way of testing your hypothesis as you're going in. So this man's got an AKI. As I ask my questions and do my examination, I'm testing the hypothesis. Could this be a catheter associated UTI? Could he be dehydrated? Has he got a blocked catheter that's or he's constipated, which is causing urinary obstruction? Or could this be a progression of his CKD? So trying to challenge your hypotheses as you're going through your history and examination. Lovely. Well done, everyone. Next slide. Thank you for contributing if you wrote in the comments. So let's go on to how to approach a patient. So briefly from history, I'm sure you all know how to take history and it's your same structure. And as we said, tests and hypotheses. These are just some points to think of, so additional stuff to think about when approaching a patient with AKI. So have they had any recent acute illness uh, that's brought them in, potentially if you're in GP and it's an incidental finding? Have they got any symptoms of systemic illness? So thinking about vasculitis, any joint pain, fatigue, skin rashes, um, anything that might flag that this is a, a widespread systemic cause. Have they had any symptoms of outflow obstruction? So abdominal pain, flank pain, uh, changes in their urinary stream, so intermittent, not emptying their bladder properly. In terms of their past medical history, is there any abdominal malignancy or past medical history or family history of bladder cancers, renal cancers, et cetera, that might be appropriate? Do they have risk factors such as their occupation, et cetera? And remember, myeloma is a big um, reason, so particularly in over 65s, new renal dysfunction, if they've got lower back pain, myeloma, is, or myeloma screen is always a reasonable differential um, to come up with. Um, have they had any medications? Have so their frizomide been increased? Have they been started on a new blood pressure tablet? Have they been taking something from Holland and Barrett, which is new and might be contributing? Is there anything in their history or family history contributing you know, 
adaptive to renal disease, is there um, a history of vasculitis, et cetera, or CKD that we need to know about? And then just a general past medical history, what are the risk factors for CKD or AKI? Any diabetes, high blood pressure that might not be controlled? So trying to think about more focused history for renal, but keeping it with open questions and doing what you normally do for your history. Next slide. So in terms of examination, I think last week, uh, for those who attended the fluid, uh, IV fluid lecture, we went through um, the assessment of fluid status. So just for those who um, haven't, uh, didn't attend that lecture. So this is how I do my fluid balance examination. It's a systematic approach that I've now just kind of do um, without even thinking. Fluid balance is something you will, without doubt, be asked to see on most on-call shifts um, and out-of-hour shifts. You always have to do fluid balance reviews. Um, as we should because we're prescribing IV fluids. So the purpose of your fluid assessment, uh, just to remind you all, is the question you're answering at the end is, is this patient hypovolemic, uvolemic or hypervolemic? I think last week we were having conversations about what different signs mean. The most important thing is you're, it's never one sign you know, on its own that's going to push you one way or the other. You're looking at the global picture of the patient in front of you. So if the cat refills okay, but the blood pressure is low and they're dry, don't let the cat refill confuse you and knock you off. Think about the overall picture. So just quickly for a reminder, so I like to, again, look at the end of the bed. Is there anything obvious that they've got IV fluids running, a big thing of Lucasade next to them? Have they got an NG tube or a RAS tube in? Are they vomiting everywhere? Um, and then starting peripherally. So what's the peripheral cat refill? What's the central cat refill? Um, fill in the pulse, the character, the rate. Um, and going up and then get them to stick their tongue out, tongue out. What's the, is it dry, is it moist? Uh, again, blood pressure is helpful as well. And if the patient is stable, line standing is helpful, seeing as any fluid depletion, please don't do it if they're sick because it won't help and it'll make them worse. Um, so once mucous membranes go onto the JVP, so get them to have a look, is it up by their ear? Do you have to push on the, hepat uh, the hepatic angle to try and improve it? Um, quick listen to the heart sounds. Is there a gallop rhythm or something that's, that might suggest heart failure? Listen to the basis for crackles, piss and edema. So feel for the sacrum and uh, peripherally to see if there's any piss and edema. And then is there any documentation of urine output? Have they got a catheter? And what do I think of the GCS? And that's like my go-to structure. And normally, if you do a bit of all of that and you can answer those questions, you'll be able to, to conclude if your patient is hypovolemic, uvolemic or hypervolemic. And ultimately, in identifying the cause of your AKI, whether this is pre-renal um, and what would be appropriate treatment, that's a really important element of AKI. Next slide. So in terms of renal failure, just these are just some pointers to think about uh, if someone who may have an AKI on CKD. So does this person have a history of renal failure I need to think about? So just quickly, these are things you might pick up when clerking patients or those of you still doing exams. So top left, we've got um, the um, AV fistula in the ACP, uh, so ACF. Uh, sometimes it can be down by the radius as well. So uh, if you see that palpating it, listening for breweries, making sure it's patent. Looking at the neck, so patients who have had uh, acute decompensations in renal failure, who've had to go be rushed to intensive care for renal replacement therapy, may have central line scars. So again, having a look, could this patient have had a history of uh, acute deterioration requiring dialysis? Top right, we've got um, excoriations for um, uh, uremia, so pruritus secondary to uremia, uh, so high urea within the blood. So have they got any kind of rashes, excoriations on their chest and their arms? Bottom left, we've got pit and edema, which I'm sure you've all seen. The middle one, we've got a renal transplant scar. So having a look, have they had any abdominal surgery? Have they been a donor? Have they received a transplant? And then bottom right is a nephrostomy tube. If they've got that in, uh, they're onto urology. <laughs> um, but again, you, you know, you don't know who you're seeing on, uh, on review sometimes. If they're sick, you do review them. So uh, that's what a nephrostomy tube will be in the flanks. Um, I something to consider. Um, alongside your examination, so have they had a fluid balance chart documented? Can they tell you their oral intake? Have they had any fluids prescribed recently? Um, what's the urine output? Have, does the patient, are they able to tell you? Is there a catheter? Have they been using bottles? And then any additional losses, so RAS tubes, stomas, urostomies, all sorts. Imaging is helpful, so having a look through, seeing particularly they've got a history of renal problems, so have they had any recent x-rays? On the x-ray in front of you, hopefully you can see a left-sided renal stone. I think it's probably hydrophrosis on the right. It looks like it's dilated from here. Um, have they had any previous ultrasounds or CT scans, which might be helpful as a baseline uh, for diagnosis? 
And then blood. So the most, as you can see from the criteria, most of the diagnosis of AKI is a comparison. So what were their bloods before? Um, when were they last taken? Do I need to repeat them now? Next slide. So in terms of your management, once you've done a good history examination, as with any patient, regardless of uh, if they're stable or unstable, always do an A to E approach. Reason for that is you, if someone's stable in front of you, you can do an A to E approach pretty quickly, um, but it's safest. So, and the more you see patients, the more you'll kind of do A to E anyway. And that's how you can get most of your information. So from a renal perspective, you're thinking about when you're seeing your patient is, is this person in front of me decompensated or compensated? Decompensated, they're sick, compensated, you've got time. So from an airway perspective, there shouldn't really be obstruction from renal disease uh, or AKI. Breathing, if they're decompensating, they may be short of breath, tachypneic, requiring oxygen, which may be suggestive of uh, pulmonary edema. From a circulation perspective, so what's their blood pressure? Are they dry? What's my fluid balance examination? Heart rate, um, and uh, what was I going to say? And if they're peripherally shut down or not. Disability, I normally do uh, abdomen, so is it soft or tender? Is there any renal tenderness when I'm palpating? Any scars I need to see? Um, can I see any catheters or tubes? Can I feel their bladder when I'm um, palpating? Do I have a big full bladder suggesting obstruction? And then everything else, always do a BM, particularly if they've got low GCS, just in case, regardless of what you're looking at. Um, and, you know, carbs, peripheral edema, um, et cetera, as part of your everything else. So just a quick ATE. In terms of your management for your um, AKI, the main thing you're doing is what is the cause and how can I fix that cause? So uh, the main thing with renal failure is that you want to increase the amount of blood going to the kidney and ultimately improve the urine output, right? So if you have a hypovolemic patient, someone who's clinically dry, you're going to be going down the IV fluids route. Generally, both fluid boluses, in, so if they're hypotensive and dry, it's a resuscitation scenario. So go down the, the IV boluses. Um, there's a lecture on mind the bleep I did last week, go into that more detail um, if you have any questions on that. If they are hypervolemic, then your patient is decompensating, in which case you're in a difficult fluid balance because uh, you need more blood flow to the kidney and they're probably intravascularly deplete, but fluid is going to the wrong place. In which case you're looking, you need senior support and you're looking at probably critical care for um, management of that. Um, particularly the hypotensive, I wouldn't start throwing diuretics, et cetera, at them, uh, particularly as you're starting off in your uh, F1 PA career, I wouldn't be going too heavy on that. Um, just because if they're already hypotensive, um, they're unwell. Um, so you need to get a review from a senior urgently. So input output monitoring. So I think the catheter is always something that, that we're taught. And if it's a septic patient, by all means catheterize. But remember catheters have side effects on themselves. Uh, they can lead to failed TWOX. People can be dependent on them and it's an infection risk. So you need to be thinking about who's the patient in front of you. Is it a young person? I can tell you now, if I was admitted with an AKI, I would not be accepting a catheter. Um, so is this a stable patient who can manage their own urine output and we can do it confidently? Obviously a catheter you can get hour by hour, it's dripping into the bag, so it's more accurate. But you can still calculate, you know, if you have everyone passes, someone passes urine every four to six hours, you can still calculate the average of how much urine they're passing. Um, equally, that you know, if they're immobile, if uh, they're really dry and it's not a reliable way of getting the urine output, a catheter is something to consider, but it's certainly not throwing a catheter with every patient. Again, I would also think about the stage of AKI. If their keratin's gone from 150 to 180 and they're mobile and moving around, not necessarily need to catheterize. Uh, and there is, you know, the guidelines do say that you need to balance the risk of catheterization. Um, so if any concerns, run it past the senior. But it, you need to have a good way of input output monitoring, be it bottles, um, not commodes, what am I thinking of? Sam, so what am I thinking of? What's the, um, not catheter, the like the, the condom thing? Convene, convene. So uh, the convenes are like, they're like, like condoms basically for men and then they pee into it. So it's not invasive, but they um, uh, can, you can still pass urine, particularly if they're immobile um, or bedpan, et cetera. So anywhere you can calculate the urine output. Um, you want to stop any nephrotoxic drugs, which we'll go on to in a little bit. Um, I think BBGs are always helpful, particularly if it's a, good, a new AKI to get a baseline for their potassium and their uh, pH. Uh, using these if they've not had a baseline for a while, so say 12 hours or so, I don't think it's unreasonable to, to take using these if you're gonna get a BBG anyway. In terms of urine dip, 
Firstly, that rules out any signs of infection, bearing in mind if they have a catheter, it may still be positive for leukocytes. So uh, think about the clinical picture always. Equally, um, if you're going to refer a patient with an AKI to a nephrologist, they'll generally want a urine dip, and that's to look if there's any protein or blood which may be suggestive of an intrinsic cause. So urine dip is an important investigation. And then finally, if you're worried about obstruction, obviously if they're obstructed, they're going to need a catheter. Uh, so bladder scanning, seeing what the residual is, if it's 500, 600, 700, and they really can't pee, uh, or it's post void, then a catheter is appropriate. Um, but in which case they may benefit from uh, ultrasound KBs or CT KBs to look at the renal tract. Next slide. So um, this was on the Minor Bleep website, I think it's from someone's entry prior. So there's an A to E of AKI, which you might find helpful to think about. So it's addressing the medications, which again, we'll go on to in a second, optimizing their blood pressure, either with fluids or maybe stopping antihypertensive drugs to maximize um, blood flow to the kidney. Again, if they've got a systolic of over 200, talk to someone before you uh, stop antihypertensives. But so again, clinical scenario, this is not uh, black or white in terms of management. Calculating their fluids. So what's their um, requirement? Is this a resuscitation or maintenance scenario? And again, you can go back to the lecture last week for advice on that. Dips at their urine and exclude obstruction as we've mentioned before. Next slide. So a couple of scenarios for you. So, um, oh, that's not good grammar, isn't it? Older, sorry. Um, so you are clerking a 56 year old gentleman who has presented with fevers, some shortness of breath and a productive cough. Um, he's had very little oral intake over the last few days. And in the last 24 hours, he's only passed urine once. And he said it was really quite dark and smelly when he did so. So on the left, you've got some observations. And the questions I have for you based on this scenario is what are your main concerns with this patient? How would you manage this patient? And what investigations would you like to order? So I'm gonna give you a bit of time for this because a lot to think about. Just to recap, a 56 year old gentleman with fevers, shortness of breath and a productive cough. There's very little oral intake over the last few days and he's passed urine once in 24 hours. Um, it was very dark and malodorous. Um, this is a direct referral to medics from a GP. So you haven't got any bloods back yet. You're the first person to see him. Um, in terms of his observations, his SATs are 93% on two litres. He's got a respirator of 24. His heart rate is 130 and regular. His blood pressure is 98 over 40 and his febrile at 39.5. So what are your concerns with this patient? How would you manage him? And what investigations would you like to order? So if you write your, your uh, ideas in the comments, um, no suggestion is silly. There is no judgment. This is a safe space. So all engagement is welcome. I can't see it directly, but I'm sure I will be told if there's any answers on that. So I think Lizzie, people are going for the first one first, of course. Um, so a few people are worried about sepsis due to a mm -hmm. UTI. Yeah. I think everyone's main concern right now. And I'll let you know people are coming in with their management plans now. Yeah, perfect. So um, main concerns are sepsis, absolutely. So this is a hypotensive tachycardic febrile patient. I think interesting that we've gone for UTI. I would actually be more concerned if you think A to E. So this is a 56 year old, we have no history on him, with shortness of breath and productive cough. He's now on a two litre oxygen requirement with stats of 93%. So my concern is more from a chest perspective, actually. Um, I agree he's certainly septic and we need to do sepsis six. Oh, cheeky clue. Um, but in terms of, uh, he may well have a urinary tract infection as well. Um, and he has got malodorous urine. Um, but my main concern, I think, firstly, is why is this 56 year old on two litres of oxygen and only on 93% sats? So just something to think about. Any management plans coming in? Yeah, we've got a few. So a lot of people are saying sepsis six, like you said. Perfect. Um, people are saying give some fluid boluses potentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lovely. Um, start antibiotics, we've got part of the sepsis six. Lovely. Um, some people have said do an A to E response and then manage the hypovolemia as necessary, which is okay. great. I like. Uh, loads of people coming in with different blood tests to do. So FBC, CRP, user knees, BBG. Lovely. Um, people are saying chest x-ray, bladder scan. Yeah, it's probably enough for you to go on now. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, it sounds like some great ideas, lovely. Should we go on to the next slide and see what my thoughts and my own scenario were? So, um, so my concerns as septic. So I've said my first concern, given the history and the saturations, is this could be the chest. Um, equally, urine is perfectly another, another good uh, suggestion because reduced urine output, um, malodorous, it could be a symptom. Um, but if we're doing our A to E approach, his airway, we'll check he's talking to us, but always you do B before C, so you must correct B before you go on to C. So with this gentleman, I would whack up his oxygen. Um, I think if anyone is desaturating, even if the COPD, start on 15% and wean down. Remember, hypoxia kills more faster than hypercapnia. So in an acute well patient, start high, titrate down, uh, aim for SATs of 94 and above, depends on the patient in front of you. Um, part of that would be AKI, sorry, no, sorry uh, ABG, um, seeing what their arterial gas is. So in which case you get part of the sepsis six as well uh, with your VBG, ABG, you just get your oxygen as well. Um, and then my main concern is also is that this man is not eating or drinking. He's had one urine output in 24 hours. He's septic. So in terms of his risk for AKI, he's acutely unwell, he's probably dehydrated, he's septic in third spacing and he's a reduced urine output. So I agree, so A to E approach, start with the chest. Another thing, could he have a stonking AKI and he's now going to decompensated uh, renal failure? He's 56, we'd hope not, it's probably all sepsis driven, but a chest x-ray would be helpful in terms of the management for that. Um, so your sepsis six for, to remember is your three in, three out. So in is IV fluids, IV antibiotics and oxygen, and your out is your blood cultures, lactate and catheter. So in this scenario, you would be catheterizing because it was sepsis six. Um, and remember, all this should be done within the first hour of arrival uh, within a &E. Input output monitoring. So he's going to have a catheter because of sepsis, um, but asking the nurses to kindly do urine, uh, hourly urine output and review him. And then have a look, what's his medication? Could there be any triggers or anything we need to hold on submission? And then I think we've gone through the investigation. So yeah, ABG, chest x-ray, urine dip uh, with the MCNS if needed. And I think bladder scan is reasonable. Is he having no urine output because he's um, obstructed or is it because he's uh, oliguric? Lovely, well done. Have I got another one for you? Yes, I do. So next, sorry, you've got a third, you're A and E F1. Uh, you've got a 35 year old lady who's had two days of left flank pain and abdominal pain. Uh, you review her and she's pacing all around the cubicle, crying out in pain, won't sit still, is in agony. Um, so you, you're going to spit some analgesia and that settles. At which point she tells you the last couple of days she's been really hot and clammy, really unwell, a bit nauseous, but not vomited. Um, but actually, from a urinary perspective, it's past urine, there's no blood in it or, or urinary symptoms. So her bloods are on the left-hand side from today. We have no baseline because she's a 35-year-old woman, doesn't come to a &E or GP particularly. So what are your differentials with this patient, given her history and her blood tests? Um, how would you manage her? And what investigations would you request? So to remind you, 35 year old, two days of left flank and abdominal pain, uh, is in a lot of pain when you see her. She's hot and cold at home, felt nauseous, uh, but no hematuria. Just in case you can't see, her hemoglobin is 120, her white cells are 12 with a CRP of 70. Her potassium and sodium within normal range, she has a urea of nine and a carotene of 135. So what are your differentials? How would you manage? And what investigations would you request? Let me know if there's any suggestions coming through. I'm loving the interaction. Particularly because I can't see anybody. Good, I think there's a few coming through. So we've got um, pyelonephritis, quite mm -hmm. a few pyelonephritis, a few um, nephrolithic, this is, I can never say that word. <laughs> uh, we've got renal colic. Oh, this is interesting. Someone's written an ectopic as a differential. Oh, yeah. Uh, we've got, yeah, kidney stones again. Loads of people going for ectopic, actually. So it's good you're thinking outside the box. <laughs> Not just an API, good. Yeah, that's what we've got for that one so far. And then I think we we'll, should have hopefully some management plans coming through soon. Lovely. So any priorities for management? So people have started with, um, so FBC, urine, uh, mm -hmm. pregnancy test. We've got mm -hmm. ultrasound KUB. Yeah, good. Um, manage with analgesia, monitoring using ease and fluids. Mm -hmm. Perfect.
Yeah, a few more for ultrasound. Good. Someone said a CT instead of an ultrasound. Okay. But yeah, I think that's it. Lovely. Great, lovely. Thank you guys for the interaction. Very good. So let's see if I agreed with you with my made up scenario. Next slide. So uh, my differential is primarily based on the right side, uh, left side of flank and abdominal pain is renal stone versus UTI or pyelonephritis. Completely agree. Uh, I think in outside the scopes of um, AKI. So could this be ectopic or torsion in women? Uh, all young women are pregnant to proven otherwise. Um, torsion is another option. Uh, constipation, uh, infective colitis, well, on that side. Um, Diaphragmatic irritation, so left-sided caps can sometimes mimic uh, pain around there. Musculoskeletal stuff. So lots of differentials and well done for thinking outside the box. Uh, those who said about ectopics and that, that's really good. Um, I think in the remits of an AKI lecture uh, and the left flank pain, given the fact she's pacing up and down, I'm thinking renal stone versus pyelonephritis. Um, so again, it'd be an A to E approach. Main thing is analgesia. So if we're thinking about renal stones, um, flank pain, uh, PR diclofenac is really helpful and works a dream in renal stones. Uh, paracetamol codeine as well are helpful to titrate up. Um, I would give fluids, and if there's a positive urine dip, consider antibiotics. Uh, particularly the fact that she's been hot, cold, shivering, shaken, and there's a CRP of 70 and a white cell count of 12. So I think infection or something is going on from an infection or inflammation setting, which is concerning. Given her renal function, obviously we don't have a baseline, which makes proving this is an AKI uh, by the definition difficult. We don't know if she's had any CKD, et cetera. But given she's a young, fit female, a creatinine of 135 is abnormal. So uh, my concern is that she's got a renal dysfunction on top of this. So uh, I just didn't put um, pregnancy tests, but absolutely all women who are uh, of childbearing age who come through A&E get a pregnancy test. Um, so pregnancy test, uh, because if you, you don't want to miss anything uh, like an ectopic. Um, urine dip. So again, is there, you know, is, there, is there microscopic blood? She said there's no frank hematuria, but we need to make sure there's no nothing microscopic. Leukocytes, uh, nitrates to prove that this is a renal cause of her infection. So ultrasound versus CT. So um, CT is arguably a better modality. Ultrasound is dependent on the user. Um, but it's no there's no radiation, it's normally quicker to get. So in young, again, fertile women or women of uh, childbearing age, ultrasound KB is preferred over CT. If ultrasound can't necessarily prove that there's a stone and there's still a high suspicion, they may go on to CT later. But generally with young women, uh, we go for ultrasound first. Um, so ultrasound KB and then blood, so FBC using the ECRP, which you've got already. BBG for baseline uh, for potassium and for uh, pH and uh, pregnancy test, absolutely. Just thing to think about uh, in this patient, we've got someone who has query renal stones uh, with colicky sounding pain uh, with raised inflammatory markers and an, ab an, an abnormal creatinine for what we would expect in her age group with no past medical history. So could this be an infected obstructed kidney? Um, so imaging would be urgent, I'd say in this lady. Um, which and that isn't a urological emergency so needs urgent review so just something to bear in mind but I agree this may not be renal at all and it may be something completely different lovely next one so just a quick note on prescribing in patients with renal failure so whether it be AKI or CKD there is a whole host of drugs which will need modification or stopping if you are uh, have patients with reduced creatinine clearance now remember if it's a CKD your EGFR is more reliable um, but with AKI, you should be looking at creatinine clearance um, rather than your EGFR, as it may not be accurate. So just some uh, ones to bear in mind in terms of altering the doses. So your opiates, um, we tend to use oxycodone rather than um, morphine in renal patients um, and tramadol doses may need to be reduced. Antibiotics are some penicillins such as uh, tazacin, there's renal dosing for, and uh, in UTI, there's a cutoff uh, for renal function with trimethoprim and nitroferentoin as well. Some anti-epileptics and immunosuppressants, so phenytoin, methotrexate, tacrolimus, may will need to have much higher, uh, more frequent monitoring of their um, levels to make sure that they're not overdosing on them uh, when their renal function is impaired. Diabetic medications, so we normally say hold the metformin if the creatinine is going up, 
uh, because of the risk of lactic acidosis. And some modified release hypoglycemic agents can have a prolonged effect in AKI, so there's a higher risk of hypoglycemia. And a common one that you'll come across is your low molecular weight heparin. Um, there are renal doses for both uh, VTE and treatment dose, so it's important to calculate your creatinine clearance as well. But again, I always speak to my pharmacist uh, on my ward because uh, I find it all a bit overwhelming and it's better to check uh, with us, someone who is much better at medications than I am. Next slide. So Samsel kindly found this um, acronym, so DAM, uh, to think about the main drugs to think about in uh, AKI and renal patients. So uh, D is diuretics. Um, a is your ACE inhibitors and ARBs. So you should be really ideally stopping these or holding these whilst they've got an acute kidney injury, um, providing the blood pressure that is okay. Um, in which case, you, if it's not, you may need to switch to a different agent. Metformin we hold. Um, NSAIDs, again, can be a cause of AKI, but also won't help it. So you do stop and hold those and think of alternative analgesia um, and lots of other drugs as well. Next one. So, uh, so here we have a medication question. So um, Samsung, do you want to do this one? This is your question. Or do you want me to do it? Um, yeah, sure, I'll do it. Yeah. So, um, so this is a 56 year old, past medical history of diabetes and COPD. Um, they have an exacerbation of their COPD and you've taken their bloods. Um, and actually, um, you, could, you guys can post in the um, comments what you think in terms of stage of AKI uh, is going on. So the baseline here is 96. And let's say that was yesterday. So it's been about 24 hours uh, and now it's 200. Um, and they are on the following drugs. So um, have a think about which ones you would uh, think about stopping or holding. Uh, and then we'll quickly run through them. And you can uh, you can post them in the in the Facebook live chat if you like. Okay, uh, so I'll carry on. Uh, actually, um, Jan, do you have any comments? So shall we? Uh, shall I just go through? Yeah, them? we've got a few people saying stage two AKI. Mhm, mm mhm. Mm so I think they're starting with that and hopefully people will say some of the medications soon. So, but yeah, some people are saying hold the metformin. I think it's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. Um, Brilliant, okay. On drugs, so. Um, so, so I'll, uh, I'll let uh, Lizzie run through the um, stages. She's probably a bit better than uh, me at that. But uh, in terms of the meds, um, exactly. So metformin, it actually increases the risk of lactic acidosis in uh, kidney failure. Doesn't necessarily um, contribute towards the kidney failure, but it can increase that risk of lactic acidosis. So you might want to consider holding it. And that's that's from what I know. And then ibuprofen and NSAID, uh, it can be toxic to the kidneys and um, furosemide. So from uh, that, uh, that mnemonic dam, diuretics, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, metformin, NSAIDs, uh, like ibuprofen, so those would be the ones to, I'd say, at least consider holding. And if you're going to consider holding metformin, think about are they meeting their um, needs in terms of lowering their blood glucose for their diabetes. And uh, of course, you know, speak with your seniors about the drugs that you are going to hold, because um, they may need something uh, different. Uh, I'll hand it back to uh, Lizzie. Yeah, great, lovely. Um, so yeah, I would agree that's a stage two AKI. It's gone up, I just had to get my calculator out, how embarrassed is that? Um, but it's gone up by just over two times the baseline. So I would agree it's a stage two AKI. Um, yeah, and agrees, metformin, ibuprofen, frisamide, lovely. Good, thank you very much. So just a quick thing about um, dialysis. So this is in the terms of an acute kidney injury. So again, remember when, I'm sa when I said, if you're reviewing patients uh, for the first time, the question, the first thing you have to answer, is this a decompensated or compensated patient? And that's regardless of what system you're seeing. In renal failure, when we're talking about decompensation and particularly in the acute 
kidney injury, it's does this patient meet the threshold requiring renal replacement therapy? So the main things to think about for renal replacement um, and things that I would just have a look at and make sure that you're getting a baseline for is are they uremic and how do they have complications of uremia? So like an encephalopathy, they're very confused um, or pericarditis. Again, not something you need to pick up as a, as, I mean, I certainly wouldn't pick up <laughs> uremic pericarditis per se, but um, if there's you know, that's a complication or the urea is incredibly high and they're confused, that's something to consider. Um, if they are overloaded, so remember I said a hypervolemic patient who has a new good going AKI and you think is in uh, pulmonary edema, um, you're going to need to get senior support in and that may be an indication for renal replacement therapy. Um, a word on that is that if you're diuresin, so if you have someone who's fluid overloaded, even if it's secondary to heart failure or whatever, um, that has a background of renal disease. If you're going to give diuresis, the diuresis may have some vasodilatory effects in the short term. But if you do, if you have a patient in front of you who does not produce urine at baseline, and they may be a dialysis patient anyway, um, diuresis is not going to do a whole lot. So asking patients, basically more, but more or less a CKD who may be dialysis patients, do you normally uh, pass urine? That's an aside. In the acute setting, if you have someone who's decompensating in fluid overload, um, that may be an indication for uh, renal replacement therapy, and you need to speak to a senior soon. Um, metabolic disturbances, so if they have a metabolic acidosis, that is not improving with treatment. So sometimes, um, particularly if they're hyperkalemic, you can give sodium bicarb, again, on advice of seniors uh, and or renal, you don't prescribe it on your own. Um, if, the, the, the P, if the pH is low, you need to get a senior to review because they're becoming uh, unstable and acidotic, um, but they may want to give some treatments. But if it's resistant metabol um, metabolic disturbances, then uh, again, it may be an indication for RRT. And again, hyperkalemia, if you have uh, treatment resistant hyperkalemia, so you've given insulin dextrose, renal, or your seniors have suggested some sodium bicarb, and it is persistently elevated, that may also be an indication for um, acute renal replacement therapy. So that's where you can see that the getting the BBG is helpful, even if it's a baseline for the pH and the potassium. Uh, pH, so BBG's potassium can be a bit spurious. So if that's what you're looking for, I normally resend the using these anyway to get a formal. Um, and fluid overload is where your uh, fluid assessment comes in. Next slide. And in terms of referring to renal, so uh, there's lots of criteria on NICE guidelines about when you should refer to renal. This is for urgent referrals. So in some trusts, all AKIs, regardless of the stage, get referred to renal um, and they will give input. It uh, depends on your trust. And certainly, as with all of this, you look at your trust guidelines and you speak to your seniors because this is not necessarily a blanket rule for all patients. But in terms of NICE guidelines, urgent referral to renal is if your patient has a baseline stage four, stage five CKD. Um, if you think it might be an intrinsic or renal cause of AKI, then certainly refer to renal. If uh, the AKI is not, not responded to treatment, again, refer. If they have complications, so we're going down, you know, the indication for dialysis, the, the urea is going up, uh, the, they become a bit more acidotic, the potassium is kind of teetering and it's not really responding, uh, referring to renal. Um, and if they're renal transplant patients um, coming in for anything, any transplant patient, you should be at baseline with speaking to their transplant team and letting them know of admission. Uh, there's been lots of, you know, there's scares where patients have not had their tacrolimus held because there's concerns that they have infections and things, but that shouldn't really be done without discussion with senior staff um, renal team and ideally you should be letting the renal transplant team know sooner rather than later. So there are other things but that's the main ones. Um, so oh I've been talking for a long time apologies um, I'm sorry if this has been a bit uh, heavy with uh, lots of information but hopefully it's helpful. Um, so take home messages generally so as the only patient history examination is testing your hypothesis and will help you to come up with uh, your main issues and start to formulate a management plan. Um, if you're seeing a patient with AKI, um, think about whether a BBG and repeat use needs may be helpful. If you've had use needs in the last couple of hours, it's not necessarily going to be helpful, but in an out of hours setting, you might want to repeat them. And I think a baseline BBG is always helpful to get your, your baseline for your acid base balance and pH, etc. Think about urine dips, is there any intrinsic causes you can pick up and the importance of fluid balance and how you're going to measure the urine output. Um, medication reviews are really important, whether you think it's a cause of the AKI or whether you think it may be contributing, um, it's important. 
Um, generally, if you hold medication and then discuss them, it's safer than giving and then having to hold things later. So by no means don't don't kind of stop medications and go home and that's it. Always escalate to a senior. But if you have a concern of, oh, maybe I should hold the frisamide, maybe I should do this, hold it or don't prescribe it and then directly speak to a senior immediately to have a conversation about whether it should be given and what alternatives can be given. Um, and again, just to be thinking about, does this patient in front of me, are they decompensating? Do I need to get senior review? Um, and is there something going on that I can't immediately fix and we need to refer to renal? And that's it. Um, in terms of, I think that might be the last, last slide. If you've got any questions, do pop them in, in the um, Facebook chat. In terms of the link, we tried the QR code earlier and we couldn't get it to work. So if it doesn't work, please do uh, do the link because it's the only way you can get feedback to uh, demonstrate to have done some teaching uh, that me, you know, Samson and I have been here and done the slides for you. And also it means we can improve the sessions in future. Samson, are you going to go back two slides for me? So just a quickly, these are just some resources I found really helpful. So obviously you've got your nice guidelines in terms of your acute kidney injury, which is I've kind of put throughout the presentation today. In terms of the BNF, uh, there's always advice on prescribing in renal impairment if you're concerned. So uh, your friendly pharmacist and also BNF is very helpful. And then we've got Think Kidney, which is a, a, new, a website that I came across. It's got Firstly, this document is amazing for medications and advice on that, but it's got a whole source of information about tackling AKI, um, patients with CKD, it's got information leaflets for renal patients um, and it's got some advice for primary care as well and then just in the bottom there's a, an app that I used as an F1, I'm not sponsored but Pocket Doctor, I think you do have to pay for it but um, has got um, a, a kind of a checklist on how to manage uh, patients who may have hyperkalemia or have renal dysfunction and you can go through and think about your differentials and main investigations to do so it may be something you find helpful. But that's it for me. I will stop talking because you've listened to me for far too long. Um, and any questions, just pop it in the um, chat box. And please, please, please fill out the feedback form. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Lizzie. It was an excellent talk. I definitely learned a lot. <laughs> and it was a really good summary of everything. Um, what have we got? Uh, we've just got a question from Mohammed just saying, what was the DAM acronym again? He missed it earlier. If you wouldn't mind going through that. Once. Yeah, yeah. I remember it. So D is diuretics. A is your ACE inhibitors and ARBs. M is your metformin. And N is your ACE, uh, NSAIDs. And then I think S is some other drug. Um, we can go back to the slides. I think they're the main four for the DAM criteria. But remember, most drugs, whatever you're prescribing, just check, see if there's any renal indications because there's so many of them. Perfect. Thanks. Um, I don't think there are any other questions, actually, but I think it was a really great talk, really summarised everything well. Uh, oh, like, Lizzie said, <laughs> like Lizzie said, uh, please make sure you feed, fill out the feedback. Sorry, I'm not sure if the QR code is working, but we've got a link in the comments on the Facebook page. Um, and then also you guys get a certificate and we'll get really helpful feedback on how to improve things. Yeah. Um, so I think that's it for today, but make sure you join us next week at the same time. We've got, I think, Annabelle doing reviewing and requesting bloods, which should be a really great topic, something that's useful every day as a doctor. Um, so I think that's it. If you do have any other questions, um, please put them in the comments and we'll be sure to look back at them and answer them if needed. Um, sorry people are saying the qr code's not working i'm really sorry it's not it's on the website and i've also sent a link on the comments um but thank you very much everyone thank you take care bye